Okay. Welcome to Test of Hypothesis Unit, BMW, that 103. My name is Timothy Kafue from School of Pure and Applied Sciences, Department of Physical and Mathematical Sciences, and welcome. Uh, test of Hypothesis concerns with the everyday questions that we answer in business or in research. Research is a continuing, a, a continuing subject throughout our lives and we have some questions to answer and the questions usually starts from what we refer to as assertion. A hypothesis is simply an assertion about a population characteristic which may or may not be true and requires data or sample data to be analyzed or collected and then analyzed in order to address the problem either to reject or support based on the evidence of the sample data. So we, in research we are saying we always have some fixed ideas about a certain population parameters based on say player experiments, survey experience, and these are only ideas and there is therefore a need to ascertain whether these ideas are correct or not. So the ascertaining is done by collecting information and that information is usually the study what we refer to as the study of the sample or we collect the sample from the population and then we decide whether our sample observations or statistics have come from the population that was actually hypothesized. So a hypothesis, as I had already said, is simply a claim about a population parameter, uh, either mean, proportion, standard deviation, or even size, uh, which we require to test. So say for example, I've given a small example, the mean Mandri cell bill in this particular city, say Dika town is 42 shillings or even dollars, it doesn't matter. The population of adults in this city with cell phone is say a proportion 0.86% or 68% of the population holds or has a cell phone. On the basis of the observed data, then one performs a test to decide whether to reject or to accept. That test is what we refer to as the hypothesis testing procedure. So when we are testing the hypothesis, we usually have what we refer to as the null hypothesis, and we denote it by H0, and it is statement of zero or no change, and is the hypothesis which is to be actually tested for acceptance or rejection. If the original claim includes less than equal to or greater than or equal to, then it is usually what we refer to as the null hypothesis. If the original claim does not include those signs, then the null hypothesis is complement of the original claim. And the null hypothesis always includes equal sign. The type of null hypothesis that we shall be looking at, we shall always denote it with the equal sign. And then the alternative will be negating that asserted population parameter. So say for example, an assertion can be the average number of TV sets in US homes is equal to three. So our null hypothesis is that H0 is equal to the average number of TVs equals to three, and it's always about the population parameter and not about the sample statistic. Here, we shall never have a sample variable. So usually in research, we have sample statistics or statistics, statistics, and parameters. This one concerns sample, or this one concerns the population. So examples of statistics are sample size, sample mean, sample variance, uh, sample proportion denoted by small p, and sample total, etc. While the Population parameters is the sample size denoted by capital N, population mean denoted by mu, population standard division or variance denoted by sigma square, and population proportion capital, well as the population total, ETC. These are parameters and these are statistics. So in the null hypothesis, we shall never have a value from that domain. We shall only have values of the population because the aim of the research is not about to make conclusions about the sample data but about the population of interest. Uh, so this is the hypothesis, null hypothesis that the population that owes or the mean number of households with a 
or the number of TV sets in every household in the U.S. is three. And now the alternative, it's not equal to three, sorry. It, 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 it is not equal to this. This is, not a, this is a, what we have said, that the null hypothesis will not be concerned about uh, statistics. It is about the population. So we begin with the assumption that the null hypothesis is true, and uh, this is the similar notation of innocent until proven guilty, and that is what we do. Then we talk of the alternative. We denote it by H1 or HA for alternative, and this is the statement which is true if the null hypothesis is not true. It establishes the status quo. It is generally the hypothesis that the researcher is trying to prove and it is, and if it is accepted, and it is accepted when the null is rejected and vice versa. The type of test, left, right, or two-tailed is based on the alternative hypothesis. So the hypothesis testing process requires that first of all, we have the claim, the population mean age is 50, or something like that, and this is what is the mean age of 50 years. Maybe the population mean age is 50 years, and the population mean is age is not 50 years. That is the negation of the null. This is the assertion. This is what we want to test. So we obtain a random sample from this particular population whom we are saying that they have a mean age of 50 years. And a random sample. Why do we say a random sample? A random sample because if the population is of size n, and we want to take a sample of size n, small n, then the number of samples available, or the number of possible samples that can be taken, possible samples. Is equal to n combine n. Say for example, we have a, a, a hypothetical population of size five. Let this one be our population of A, B, C, D, A. That is five items. If we want a sample of size two, the possible number of samples of size two are A, B, A, C, A, D, A, A, uh, B, C, B, D, B, A. These are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, B, E, and then C, D, C, E, and then D, E. That is 10. Those are 10 samples. And this is simply 5 combined 2, which is 5 factorial, over 2 factorial, 3 factorial, which is equal to 10. So that is actually what happens when we are taking a random sample. We say any one of these samples could have taken, that is why we refer to them as random samples. Now suppose the sample mean age was found to be 20. This is the X bar. Remember we have said about the statistics. Then this is significantly lower than the claimed mean population age of 50. And if the null hypothesis were true, the probability of getting such a different sample mean would be very small. So we reject the null hypothesis. In other words, getting a sample of mean 20, age, average age of 20, when we had actually prostrated that the age is 50, it is almost impossible. So this is how the sampling distribution of the mean usually behaves. So we talk of the sample, sampling distribution of X bar. This is simply the, we have each one of these sample provides us with a, with an estimate of the population mean, and there are 10 of them, there are 10 of them. So we can get the mean of these means and also the standard error of these means. That is what we refer to as the sampling distribution of the statistic sample mean in this particular case. And it is known that X bar is normal with a mean of that one of the population standard deviation of the population divided by the sample size. That is known. This is what we refer to as the sampling distribution of the sample mean. So we shall use it. And after we have drawn its normal curve, so its mean is supposed to fall at the center because the mean is usually at the center. Now, in case we collect a sample and we realize that the sample mean is found to be 20, then we say that this one is too far. It, it is unlikely to obtain a mean of average age of 20 when the actual population mean is as a, as a, as a suggested to be 50. So when it is on the extremes, then we reject 
the null hypothesis of equality and we settle for the alternative. If actually the true value for the sample mean is that one. But we are also saying that this is unlikely. If the sample mean is close to the assumed mean population, then the null hypothesis is not rejected. We would have expected this 20 to be so close to 50 for us not to reject the null hypothesis. If the sample mean is far from the assumed mean population, the null hypothesis is rejected. Levels of significance and the rejection region. Now we ask ourselves, how far is in, far enough to reject H0? The critical value of a test statistic creates a line in the side for decision making. It answers the question of how far is far. This value is given by the level of significance denoted by alpha. And this level of significance alpha is not obtained from the sample values it, or sample data. It is actually decided before we even collect the data. So the level of significance is a demarcating line or the accuracy with which we want to report whether we are going to reject or accept or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So the critical region is the set of all values which would cause us to reject H0 and the critical values which separate the critical region from the non-critical region. So we have what we call a critical value. It separates the critical region from non-critical region. And the critical values are determined independently of the sample statistics by the value alpha, which we have said we decide before we correct the data. So the level of significance alpha is here. For a two-tailed test, we divide the area into two. So alpha over two, alpha over two, and this is the critical value. Well, this is the critical regions. These are the rejections where if we calculate the test statistic that falls in this region, then we reject the null hypothesis. Otherwise, if it falls here, we fail to reject. And these are what we refer to as the critical values obtained from the table. For alpha equals to 5%, this is actually 1.96, as we shall see from the tables. And when alpha is 1%, because usually in hypothesis testing, the level of 5 and 1% are regularly used, are the most frequently used. This is 2.58, as we shall see from the tables later. So we have already talked about the sampling distribution of the statistic, and we have said that the it's considering all possible samples of size N drawn from a population of size capital N. For, some, for, for example, the sample mean, its mean is equal to that one of the population and its standard error is that one of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. It's normally distributed and the test statistic that we use when we are dealing with uh, a normal distribution is Z and it's obtained as such. And this one is the one that forms the critical region that we shall be considering. Possible errors in hypothesis test decision making. So when we are conducting hypothesis testing, there is a possibility that we might reject a true null. That one we call it type one error. And there is also a possibility that we might accept a false null and that one we call it type two error. So type one error we say it is simply the mistake of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true and it is usually more a serious error. So the probability of type 1 error is denoted by alpha, which is also referred to as the level of significance, and it is set by the researcher in our defense. Usually 0 0.5 and 1 are the common levels of significance. If no level of significance is given, we usually prefer or advise the student to use a level of 0 0.5, but most likely the level of significance will always be indicated in each and every question. But in case it doesn't, then 0 0.5 will suffice to answer the hypothesis problem. So the level of the significance is simply, or is the complement of the confidence level in estimation. So when we are finding the region within which a particular parameter of the population lies with a certain confidence, it is usually this level of significance that we usually use and the point estimate to determine the critical region. So type 2 error, we have said it's the mistake of failing to reject the null hypothesis when it is false and we denote it and that probability is denoted by beta. Or we do some remarks, the confidence coefficient 1 minus alpha is the probability of not rejecting H0 when it is true and the confidence level of hypothesis testing is 1 into 100 multiplied by 1 minus alpha to give us 
the limits. And the power of the test statistic is simply one minus beta probability of rejecting H0. We have a summary below of when we reject and when we fail to reject. So we have possible hypothesis to test. We have the null hypothesis and we have the we have the null hypothesis and then we have the decisions that we make. We have the actual situation and the decision taken. We have failed to reject H0. When actually H0 is true, then there is no error here. And if we do not reject H0 and H0 is also false, then, then that is type 2 error. And when we reject H0 and H0 is true, we have type 1 error and that probability is alpha. Now when we reject H0 and H0 is false, there is no error made and the probability is 1 minus beta. But when we fail to reject H0 and H0 is true, then the probability is 1 minus alpha and there is no error also. Relationship between type 1 and type 2. Type 1 and 2 cannot happen at the same time because we offer two alternatives which are either reject or accept and therefore there is no way it can happen that we shall have the two errors at the same, same time. Type 1 error can only occur if H0 is true. That is we reject H0 when it is true and we have type 1 error and type 2 error can only occur if H0 is false. The if type 1 error probability is alpha it increases, type increases, then type 2 error decreases because the 2 must add up to 1. That is, alpha plus beta must be equal to 1. Alpha plus beta equals to 1, where alpha is the level of significance, beta is the probability of making type 2, and this is the probability of making type 1 error, and must be equal to 1. So if 1 increases, the other one must be decrease, must decrease because the sum must also must add up to one that is what we notice then test statistic sample sample statistics you just to decide whether to reject or fail to reject the hypothesis we have the probability value which we call p value and this is the probability of getting the results obtained if the null hypothesis is true if this probability is too small smaller than the level of significance then we reject the null hypothesis. If the level of significance is the area beyond the critical values, then the probability value is the area beyond the test statistics. Yes, these two are key. We have the normal distribution like that, and this is the area that we are referring to as alpha, the p-value. We are saying it is area beyond the critical region. Suppose this is the, the critical value here. The crit sorry, the critical value here. Critical values. These are the critical values, and this is the level of significance. If the p-value is smaller than the level of significance, then we fail to reject because what that one tells us is that the calculated test statistic will fall within the rejection region. This is the rejection region and this is the acceptance region. The acceptance region. So if the probability is too small, smaller than the level of significance, then we reject. If the level of significance is the area beyond, we have looked at that one, and then the decision. This is simply a statement based on the null hypothesis. It is either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis and we go ahead and make the managerial decision. Remember, research is not about the data that we are analyzing in the room. It is about the decision that we wanted to make and that is why we, we are ready to collecting the data. So we make a managerial statement regarding the hypothesis testing that we were conducting. So a statement which indicates the level of evidence, sufficient or insufficient, at what significance and whether the original claim is rejected or supported. Steps in hypothesis testing. So the steps are, I always advise the students if possible, first of all, you indicate the sample statistics on one side and then the population parameters from the question itself 
And then the first and foremost step is to state the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So we use the alternative hypothesis to identify the type of test. We use the alternative hypothesis to identify the type of test. By type of test, we mean whether it is left tilt, right tilt, or non-directional or two-tailed test. And then we specify the level of significance. Then we find the critical value using the tables. Then we compute the test statistics and then make a decision regarding whether to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis and then light the conclusion. The conclusion is reporting about the question which was understood. day. So we look at what we mean by left-tailed tests. Uh, where the alternative hypothesis denoted by H1 is the parameter value. Parameter is less than the value indicated or by the null hypothesis. We notice that the inequality points to the left and the decision rule is reject if the test statistics is less than the critical value. This is what we indicated as the critical value and if the calculated value falls within this region, then we reject the null hypothesis. Otherwise, we accept. In the light-tailed test, we realize that the parameter, the population parameter value is supposed to be greater than the postulated value by the null hypothesis, and they are, these are just points to the right-hand side of the decision rule here is reject H0 if the test statistics is greater than the critical value. Now, on this side, it is greater. The reason why we said the other side is smaller is because most probably because the normal distribution extends from minus infinity to pos positive infinity. The values may be greater in magnitude, but ac in actual sense, they are less because they are negative. But on this side, it is greater than the critical value. And then finally, we have the two-tailed test. And the sign for the alternative hypothesis is that it is not equal to. So we divide alpha by 2, and these are the critical values, and the critical regions are those, and that is the non-critical region. Conclusion, if the test statistic falls in the non-rejection region, we fail to reject H0. If the test statistics falls in the rejection region, we reject the null hypothesis and express the managerial conclusion in the context of the problem note. Conclusions are sentences which answer, sentences answers which include whether there is enough evidence or not based on the decision and whether the original claim is supported or rejected. Conclusions are based on the original claim which may be the null or the alternative hypothesis. Approaches to hypothesis testing. There are Three approaches to hypothesis testing. We can use the critical critical value, or we can use the p-value, or we can use the confidence interval. But first of all, let us look at the approach using what we call to what we refer to as the classical approach. The classical approach to hypothesis testing is to compare a test statistic with the critical values. So this test statistic is the one that we calculate. And for normal Z, or for normal distribution, the Z statistic denoted that way is X bar minus mu over sigma over root N. We compare this one with the table value. So we talk of the computed and tabulated. If the computed is greater in magnitude than tabulated, then we always reject the null hypothesis using the classical approach. It is best used for distributions which give areas and require you to look up the critical value, like the student's distribution, rather than distributions which have, which require you to look up a test statistic to find an area, like the normal distribution. So for example, here we are talking of the student distribution and comparing the normal. So we are saying that for, or we are preferring that for student t, the, crit the classical approach is preferred. Well, for the normal distribution, we would prefer another one that we shall call the p-value because on top of giving you the rejection region, it also indicates the level of significance at which one may be able to reject or accept or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And the classical approach also has three different decision rules depending on whether it is left, right, or tail, or non-directional, and one problem with the 
classical approach is that if the different levels of significance are desired, a different critical value must be read from the table. So you keep on going back to the table. If the level of significance that we would require to reject the null hypothesis is required. So the p-value approach is better, or p for short for probability value. So instead of comparing the z-scores or t-scores as in the classical approach, we compare probabilities or area, like I had said before, we compare this area, this is the p-value, and this is the critical region, we compare it with alpha, given by alpha. So we simply compare the two areas, which one is smaller. If p-value, as you can see, it is on the, within the, the alpha area, then it means we simply reject because whenever p-value is less than alpha like that. Otherwise, we fail to reject. So the level of significance alpha is the area in the critical region. That is the area in the tails to the right or left of the critical values. That is what we have indicated there. And the p-value is the area to the right or left of the test statistic. If it is a two-tailed test, then look up at the probability in one tail and double it. If the test statistic is in the critical region, then the p-value will be less than the level of significance as we have already indicated here. And then it doesn't matter whether it is left, light, or tail, the two-tailed, the rule is always holds that so long as p-value is less than the level of significance, then the procedure is to reject the null hypothesis. So the p-value approach is best suited for normal distribution when doing calculations by hand. However, many statistical packages will give the p-value but not the critical value. This is because it is easier for a computer or a calculator to find the probability than it is, it is for the calculator or computer to find the critical value. Another benefit of p-value is that one immediately knows at what level of testing becomes significant. This one we had mentioned earlier, and that p-value of would be rejected at, but, but it would fail to be rejected at since this is greater, but it is less. We reject when it is less, but fail to reject when it is greater, because when it is greater, it means it will fall in the acceptance region. The level of significance is predetermined before taking the sample. It doesn't depend on the sample at all, and it is the area in the critical region that, uh, that is beyond the critical values. It is the probability at which we consider something unusual, and the probability value can only be found after taking the sample. It depends on the sample. So that is a key difference between the level of significance and the p-value. P-value is obtained after the sample data has been collected, that it has been calculated, whereas alpha is decided before even we collect the data. The probability value can only be, yeah, that one we have seen, and then it is the area beyond good testing. We want now to have a test of hypothesis testing using a single mean, testing for a single mean. So most situations in business or even in life, our interest is to find out what is the existing average condition within either business setup or even in life. Say for example, we would like to know what is the average lifespan of Kenyans or what is the average income of a particular farm or what is the income of suburb dwellers in maybe slums in Nairobi. So this is what we mean by a single mean. We want to look at a single issue and want to find out what is the average daily income for people within a particular suburb. So the value of all population parameters in the test statistic come from the null hypothesis, mean standard deviation ETC, and the following hypotheses are to be tested. So the null hypothesis says that the mean income, say for example, if we take the income, the mean income is equal to, say, mu naught, where mu naught could be, say, 50 shillings per day. Well, the alternative says the mean income is not 50 shillings per day. It could be something else. It could be less. It could be more. See, this is another alternative. The mean income is more than 50. Suppose mu naught is 50. The mean income is less. There are people maybe who earn even less. 
or a mu naught is some hypothesized value. So we, we are trying to say, look at a question whether the mean income of people in low income areas, they add maybe mu naught, where mu naught we are putting it maybe at 100 shillings or 50 or so forth. So the test statistics and the critical values depend on whether sigma is known or not. For a normal population, when sigma is known, or the standard deviation of the population is known, uh, what we do not know, or what we are trying to find out, or to either reject or accept is the mean income, but the standard deviation is known, then when standard deviation is known, we use the Z test statistics. When standard deviation of the population is not known, and the population size is also small, then we use what we call the T test statistics. But also to mention that in this case, if the population, the sample size, the sample that we have taken is large, some textbooks give large samples as say size 20 or 30, then we would use the sample standard deviation to approximate the population standard deviation and we can actually use the Z test. But when the population standard is not known and the sample size is small, then we use the T test statistic, which we are going to look at it later and how we calculate it. Then when the population standard division is known, we want to deal with one problem. If the population standard division is known, then the population mean has a normal distribution and the test statistic is Z as earlier mentioned, and the standard formula is Z is equal to X bar. The sample mean, you subtract the population mean over the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. The critical value is obtained from the normal tables. We are going to look at the normal tables and then we are ready all to look at a small example on a single mean test. Test at 5% therefore, the claim that the true mean number of TV sets in US homes is equal to three. Suppose the sample results yeah, we want to test at 5% level. They claim that the true mean number of TV sets in US home is three. Now, suppose a sample of 100 homes were sampled and the mean number of TV sets became 2.84 and the standard deviation of the population with TV sets is known to be 0 0.8. Then, of course, because our sample size is huge and the standard deviation of the population is known, we use the Z test and the appropriate statement of the null and alternative are obtained from the question itself. So we are required to test at 5% where the level, the claim that the true mean number of TV sets in home is equal to three. So the null hypothesis is mean number of TV sets equals to three. And the other one, it's non-directional mean it's not equal to three. We are not told whether they are less or more, but we are not, we are, we just want to test whether they are equal to three. So they could be less, they could be more. So this is the alternative hypothesis. It's a two-tailed test. We determine the critical values for alpha. The critical values are 1.96 plus or minus. What, how do we get that value? We have the tables for normal distributions and table values exist of various forms. What we need to know is that when we are using a particular table, we need to read the instructions as to what the table gives, say area to the left of Z. Then we have Z, then we have 0 0.00 and 0 0.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, all the way up to this 3.9. And then 0 0.01 all the way up to 0 0.09. Then this value here is 0 0.500. It tells us that the area symmetrical is 0 0.5, like that. That is 0 0.5. So probability Z is less than or equal to 0 is equal to 0 0.5. It is halfway through the area, the total area that the probability distribution curve is supposed to be equal to one, then when we have 
this is the value that we are reading here. It tells us that the area to the left of z equals to zero because the mean is supposed to be here. The standard z has got a mean of zero and a variance of one. Then the area to the left is 0 0.5. And then this, that is how we read the values. We look at the table here. This is what I was just bringing forward, that the area uh, tables value represent area to the left of z scores. You may have other area tables that indicate that the table values represent area between 0 and the z score. So you need to be very careful when you are using a table. You look at the table, what it explains. For example, this 0 0.5000 indicates that the area to the left is halfway through 0 0.5 because the total area is supposed to be 1. Now, we go back to the problem. We are saying we want to find out at 5% level. If it is a one-tailed test, the value at 5% is here, 0.5%. And then, and then we are required to find the Z score at 0.5%. That is what it means. Now let's look at the value again, the critical Z value are 1.96. Where do we get this 1.96? Where do we get this 1.96 from the table? So we are saying we want to find the area in between. The area, this area here, alpha over 2, that is 5 over 2 percent, and 5 over 2 percent. This area. this area should be 95% or 0 0.9500 like that. So we want an area that will give us in between 95% and these critical values are what we are looking at. And from the table, this is 1.96 negative and this is 1.96 positive. We can get them here from the table, 1.96. 1.96 is here. Yeah, at the intersection of 1.96. Yeah. Yes, this area, if you look at it, is simply 0 0.975. So we have taken the half on the other side. So it is giving areas to the left of the Z. So this, the total area should be this one included with 5 over 2 percent. So it gives us 0 0.975 and this is the value. So because of symmetry, the other one we don't have to bother about it. We just know that it is minus 1.96 due to symmetry because the normal curve is symmetrical about the mean and that is how we get the 1.96. 1.96. 1.96 is here. So that is it. And then we go back to the question. We determine the critical value for calculated test statistic. We use the mean, sample mean. We take away the postulated population mean. The standard division of the population is known. And the sample size of the we had taken is 100. The square root of that one is 10. And the calculated Z is minus 2.0. This is a left-sided test statistic, and the critical region is as indicated next here. This is the minus 2, and this is the minus 1.96. We realize that the calculated is within the rejection region or the critical region. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis that the that the average number of TV sets in U.S. homes is three, so we have rejected that one. So we are now saying, we have adopted the alternative which says they are not equal to three, they could be something else. So since said calculated is less than tabulated, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the number of TV sets is not equal to three at 5% level of significance. It's so important to indicate at whatever level the null hypothesis has been rejected because it could be accepted at another different level. When the population standard deviation is unknown and the sample size is less than 20, then we use the student T statistics. 
we use the student t statistics given as such and the test is very similar the statistics is very similar to the z score except that the population standard deviation has been replaced by the sample standard deviation and z is replaced by t so the critical values are obtained from t tables with n minus one degrees of freedom so when we have small samples samples whose size is not more than or equal to 20 but they are less and the population standard deviation is unknown we can no longer use the z test statistic but we use the student t there's a second example of hypothesis testing now we look at a fertilizer mixing machine is said to give 12 kgs of nitrate for every 100 kg bag of fertilizer so if you take a fertilizer of 100 kg bag and then you do some process with it you are supposed to get 12 kgs of nitrate from every bag of 100 kgs of fertilizer then 10 100 kg bags are sampled and the percentage of nitrates were so the percentage and the number of kilograms are the same because we are dealing with a hundred kg bag so 11 14 12 13 12 and so forth so this is the sample obtained at five percent level of significance is the machine defective once again this is a two-sided test and uh, the null hypothesis is that the machine is not effective and that is the average the mean number the, the mean kilograms of nitrate produced by every 100 bag of fertilizer is supposed to be 12 kgs well the alternative it is not it could be defective it could be producing more nitrate or less since sigma is unknown this is a t-test and the, the unbiased estimate of the sample standard deviation is given by wow there is a square here there is a square here we are supposed to have a square there yeah s is supposed to be the square root of sum of xi minus x bar squared over n minus one there is a correction there and the critical region based on alpha nine degrees of freedom because we have ten observations the degree of freedom is the number of independent observ or observations that contribute to the value that we are interested in the sum or the mean so they are one two three four five six seven eight nine ten we take one the degrees of freedoms are nine the degrees of freedoms are nine so using a t table we can obtain the table value at five percent and nine degrees of freedom and that value is two point two two point two six two we have a t table t distribution table here with nine degrees of freedom and five percent two-tailed we have five percent divided by two is 0 0.25 that is two-tailed this is the t value that we get back to the question and then the sample mean you add everything here and you divide by 10 you get 12.5 and the sample standard deviation obtained using this formula after rectifying the square here you get 1.0801 uh, the t calculated is obtained by taking the sample mean you subtract the postulated population mean of the nitrate and this one is a decimal not a comma it's a decimal not a comma and the value we get is positive 1.4639 since the calculated is less than the table value we fail to reject and conclude that the machine is not defective at five percent level of significance so that is an example of testing about a single mean when the population standard deviation is unknown and the test statistic to apply is the t-test and you compare the calculated with the table value at that percent level of significance after stating the hypothesis and then we reject or we fail to reject because the calculated is within the acceptance region and conclude that the machine is not defective now we want also to test there is also the need in business or even in other forms of areas to test whether the means of two populations are the same we would want to see whether if given two teachers for example they are teaching two streams they are each, each teaching a stream in the two 
classes in a secondary school in Form 4, we would want to know whether there is, there is a difference in performance between the two classes or the two teachers by considering their mean mark, maybe in a particular subject, say mathematics, and we want to see whether there is a significant difference between the two classes. So what we do, we observe the sample, first stream A and stream B, we get their mean and so then we come up with a hypothesis which we are referring to as testing of the differences between two sample means. Large samples, sometimes it is n greater than 20 or 30. So in business, those, those, those informed are constantly, informed are constantly observant about the standards of specifications of the items which they sell, e.g. a trader may receive a bunch of items at one time and another bunch at a later time and at the end may have concluded that the two samples are different. In certain specifications, mean weight or mean lifespan, mean length ETC or even the scores of the class as the average performance of the students as we have given earlier. Further, it may become necessary to establish whether the observed differences are statistically significant or not. If the differences are statistically significant, then it means that such differences must be explained. That is, they are there are some known causes that brings about the differences, but if they are not statistically significant, then it means that the differences observed have no known causes and are mainly due to chance. If the differences are established to be statistically significant, then it implies that the complaints which necessitated that kind of a research or a test are varied or justified. So what we have is let x1 and x2 be two any samples whose sizes are N1 and N2 with mean 1 and mean X bar 2 and the standard deviation says 1 and respectively. In order to test the difference between the two sample means, we apply the following formula. Z is simply the mean of sample 1 minus sample 2 minus the population means because these ones are samples. But remember, under the null hypothesis, mu 1 minus mu 2 is supposed to be equal to 0. So meaning that we do not have to subtract something there. And the standard error of the difference of the samples is given by the square root of sample one over the standard division of the first sample, a variance of the first sample over its sample size added and then we find the square root. So we have an example, an, agro, an, ag, an agronomist was interested in a particular fertilizer yield output. He planted maize on 50 equal pieces of land and the mean harvest obtained later was 60 bags per plot with a standard deviation of 1.5 bags. Then the crops grew under the natural circumstances and conditions without soil being treated with any fertilizer. Then the same agronomist carried out an alternative experiment where he picked 60 plots in the same area and planted the same plant of maize but a fertilizer was applied on these plots. After the harvest, it was established that the mean harvest was 63 bags per plot with a standard deviation of 1.3 bags. We want to conduct a statistical test to establish whether there was a significant difference between the mean harvest under the two types of field conditions, where one condition is that the maize is grown naturally, and the other one is that the maize is grown under accelerated. Uh, fertilizer or where it is accelerated by or the harvest is boosted by fertilizer. So the solution is, the hypothesis to test is that uh, mean one is equal to mean two, sorry, this one is serious. This is not the correct hypothesis. The correct hypothesis is that uh, mu one equals to mu two. There is no difference between the two farming procedures and the alternative is that mu one equal not to mu two, that there is a difference between the two ways. This is grossly, this is not correct. So the critical value at z alpha over two is 1.96 and the standard error of the sample difference is given as such and the calculated test statistic is uh, 11, the modular, the magnitude. 
So we have the regions indicated here. This is alpha over 2 because we are testing a two-tailed test. Remember, we have said that this is not the correct hypothesis. The correct hypothesis is here that the mean yield from the natural farming, mu1, is equal to the mean yield after applying fertilizer. That is, the fertilizer has got no effect. The two methods are the same, whereas well the alternative is that they are not the same. There is a difference, whether more or less, and that is the critical region. For two-tailed test, we have 1.96 and 1.96 negative as the critical values. Since the calculated is bigger than the table value of 11, we have seen it's 11.11, we reject the null hypothesis of equality of the two methods and conclude that the two methods are not the same, that the fertilizer has boosted the yield. The fertilizer has boosted the yield. So we say that the difference between the harvest is statistically significant at 5%. This implies that the fertilizer had a positive effect on the maize harvest. And that is the end of our lesson one on tests of hypothesis. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.